Good evening. My name is Scott McDougall, and on behalf of the Anti Discrimination Commission Queensland and the Queensland Performing Arts Centre, welcome to the 2019 Marbo Oration. I'm sure, like me, you're looking forward to hearing from our guest, Luke Pearson, who, after delivering his oration, will be joined by ABC radio journalist Rihanna Patrick for a question and answer session before we finish up this evening with some more entertainment from local Indigenous outfit, The Ancient Bloods. We have a fantastic turnout tonight, and as we're all assembled here in the traditional lands of the Yuggera and Turrbal people, I'd like to pay my respect to all of their descendants who are in the audience tonight, and their Jagera and Turrbal ancestors, present day elders, and elders of the future. There are a number of other people in the audience I'd like to acknowledge and thank. Firstly, the Marbo family. We are immensely uh, proud to, be, to have our association with the Marbo family in hosting this event. And thank, and whereabouts are you? There's uh, Salua, Melita, Jesse and Edward. I thought I had cute children, but some of the cutest children on the planet belong in that family. We, we, uh, it is an absolute honour for us to continue this uh, association with your family. And we really appreciate it and cherish it. There are a number of other people in the audience, I feel, um, that we also need to acknowledge. And they include the chair of QPAC Board of Trustees, Meritus Professor Peter Coldrake, co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples and previous Mabo orator, Mr. Les Melzer, president of the Land Court, Her Honour Fleur Kingham, director general, Department of Environment and Science, Mr. Jamie Merrick, director general, Department of Transport and Made Roads, Mr. Neil Scales, public service commissioner, Mr. Rob Setter, Queensland Ombudsman, Mr. Phil Clark, Mayor of the Torres Strait Council, Ms. Bonda Malone. CEO of Legal Aid Queensland, Mr. Anthony Riley. CEO of QCOS, Ms. Mark Henley. Mr. Mark Henley. And finally, University of Queensland Pro Vice Chancellor, Indigenous Professor Bronwyn Fredericks. There are many um, what I would describe as VIPs and CIPs, and that's uh, culturally important people in this room tonight, so I welcome you all. I would now call upon QPAC elder and residence, Auntie Colleen Wall, who is going to pay tribute to the, lay Mrs. To the late Mrs. Bernardo Mabo. Benita Mabo. I'm really pleased I can't see you out there. I'm very honoured to stand here tonight um, and honour Auntie Benita. Um, she's been a star in my life for about eight years now. Um, as Chair of Queensland South Native Title Services, I've met her at nearly all of the Native Title Conferences and had a chat. And the Commission's asked me to deliver the tribute tonight and I'm most honoured to do that for the Commission as well. Mrs. Marbo was born in Halifax, Queensland in 1943 and was one of 10 children. She was an Australian South Sea Islander of Ni Vanuatu descendant whose ancestors were taken to work in the sugarcane industry in Queensland. My family has South Sea Islander um, descendant as uh, I'm a South Sea Islander descendant as well. So I really honour what she's done for our community. Benita married Eddie in 1959 and together they raised 10 children and I honour their family. In 1973, Mr and Mrs Marbo established the Black Community School in Townsville where, queens, where children could learn and grow with their own culture. In 2013, Mrs Marbo was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to the Indigenous community 
and to human rights as a, an advocate for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander peoples. In 2018, a star was named in her honour by the Sydney Observatory. In 2018, James Cook University conferred upon Mrs Marbo an honorary doctorate of letters in recognition for our, her outstanding contribution to social justice and human rights. Last year, I, I was honoured to attend her state funeral in Townsville, um, where a thousand, over a thousand people attended to honour her life's work. She's described as a quiet, loving, passionate and caring woman with a remarkable ability to speak up and be heard when needed. Mr and Mrs Marbo's contribution and persistence in the fight for social justice and human rights for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and South Sea Islander community was formidable and tireless. And I must say there that the family has always been behind her. Tonight's oration represents the Commission's long-standing commitment to the memory of Eddie Quirky Marbo and the significance of the High Court decision that bears his name. That decision legally recognised that Indigenous peoples have a special relationship to the land and waters. It secured traditional title for all future generations. Mrs Marbo has graced this oration with her presence on all but one occasion when ill health prevented her from attending and we miss her presence here tonight. But I know she's watching over us. The Commission considers it's a privilege to have had a connection with Mrs Marbo whose strength, integrity and generosity will long stay with us. As the Chair of Queensland South Native Title Services, as well as um, the, the elder in residence here, I valued her graceful presence in our Native Title world and in our arts and cultural world. She will shine for a long time to come in our presence. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie. Tonight we honour Eddie Marbo and are inspired by his determination to prove, through the Australian courts, a truth that he had always known, the system of traditional ownership of lands and waters of the Torres Strait. To do this, Eddie Marbo had to walk in two worlds, and his legacy was in building a foundation for land rights through native title. Almost two years ago, the gracious Uluru Statement from the Heart sought a means, through constitutional reforms, to empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to take their rightful place in their own country. It anticipated that, when we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be the gift to their country. But the authors of the Uluru Statement also acknowledge that their present day reality was different. Proportionally, the most incarcerated people on the planet, youth languishing in detention in obscene numbers, and they decried the torment of our powerlessness. I believe that in years to come, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull will come to understand and lament the significance of the opportunity that he, on behalf of the people of Australia, was unable to grasp, an opportunity to share power, an opportunity for children and culture to flourish. On Wednesday last week, the newly sworn in Indigenous Affairs Minister, the Honourable Ken Wyatt, became Australia's first Aboriginal person to hold a federal cabinet position. The Minister's elevation promises to be a great step forward for our nation, but we can and must move towards structural change in which power is shared and the opportunities of partnership move from rhetoric to reality. As we wait to see what unfolds with constitutional recognition at a national level, here in Queensland we've recently seen some groundbreaking development in the recognition and protection of rights. On the 27th of February this year, the Queensland Parliament, 
through the passage of the Human Rights Act, made a clear declaratory statement about the human rights to be protected under Queensland law. The 23 rights, which include the distinct cultural rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, will be protected from 1 January 2020. On 1 July this year, just in a few weeks' time, so I remind my staff, the Anti-Discrimination Commission Queensland will become the Queensland Human Rights Commission. And we will be working hard to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from Tweed Heads to Saibai Island know they have rights and importantly, how they can exercise and assert them. This is a big job, so I'm hoping many of you in this room will get the Murray grapevine going and help us out. And now let me introduce you to someone who has invented his own kind of electronic Murray grapevine. Luke Pearson is a Milleroy man who founded at Indigenous X in 2012. Luke has worked as a teacher, mentor, counsellor, public speaker, collaborator, mediator, facilitator, events manager, researcher, evaluator, reporter, and believe it or not, much more. Luke's passion for Indigenous X stems from his belief in the need to improve Indigenous media representation in Australia and to have a platform for individuals to tell their own story in their own words. As I mentioned earlier, there will be a QA and a session at the end of Luke's oration. We're collating the questions via Twitter, so if you'd like to ask one, please tweet it using the hashtag MarvoOration. So now would you please join me in welcoming Luke Pearson to the stage to deliver the 2019 Marbo Oration. Thank you, Scott, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Hi, Sophie. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to give thanks to Shannon for a beautiful welcome to country, um, to Tooza Crowd for the wonderful performance, to Auntie Colleen for that very moving tribute, and I'd like to pay my respects to Salua, Jesse, Eddie and Melita. Um, it's so humbling to be invited to deliver an oration of, of this significance and honour the life of Eddie Koiki Mabo here tonight. So, um, I'd also like to pay my respects to all mob. Um, I know we've got um, NT mob, we've got a lot of Torres Strait Islander mob. Um, myself, I'm a Gamilaroi man. Um, so, yeah, ev everyone who's here and who made the effort to be here tonight, I'd just like to say thank you. I was told the theme broadly for tonight's talk was going to be about human rights. But I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact because what I want to talk about tonight is indigenous rights, and they're not too distinct, but they are special and they are important. And I think tonight of all nights on Mabo Day, it's important for us to remember our rights as indigenous peoples. The legacy of Mabo is so hard for me to, to define. I've been thinking a lot about this and very mindfully to do that with his family here tonight. There is the myth, the legend that Marba has become that speaks to so many of us, but I think it's also important to remember that all of these people we talk about who have achieved so much are people. They have families, they went home, they went to bed, they worked, they fought, they struggled for this perseverance, for this success for all of us. But of all the people I think back of and all that so many of our mob have achieved in the past, defeating the myth of terra nullius, I can't think of a greater gift to Australia and particularly to Indigenous people than such an amazing feat. He fought for his truth, a truth that he never let sight of and a truth that belongs to all Indigenous peoples, a very simple but very profound truth, that this is our land. 
We are the sovereign peoples of this land. Our sovereignty was never ceded. And that truth and so many of our indigenous rights are wound up within that one simple truth. But just as that flag was planted in the soil to declare Australia as terra nullius, so too was the myth of terra nullius planted within the national story of Australia, within the psyche of all Australians. That core myth of terra nullius led to every other myth that has plagued Indigenous peoples and every misdeed that has grown from that. The myth that we were hunters and gatherers, that we were primitive peoples, that we had no science, no agriculture, that we did not care for our children. These myths justified not just our dispossession but also our control and our regulation. And these myths were essential for Australia to paint itself as a country that was settled. Stories of explorers and adventurers, of battling farmers conquering the land, but too rarely was it acknowledged the people that had to be removed from that land in order for those farms, for those cities, for those towns to be built. Those stereotypes, those myths, those if we're speaking plainly, and I think it's important we do tonight, those lies have led to every single thing you can think of that has been done to Indigenous people. And yet throughout all of those, the one thing that we have kept on to more than anything else <laughs> is our truth. And it is not just our truth, it is the truth. That, we'll see if they can get the marks. Right. <laughs> that truth that we know who we are, because when we look across the impacts of colonisation on all Indigenous people around Australia, it's hard to pinpoint, because we've all had such different experiences, that process from 1770 and then through 1788, through the rest of the country. Some mob didn't see white followers until 100 years later. Some people had very different interactions with the white people they encountered, with the missionaries they encountered. And so it's hard to try and sum that up within any one group. But at some of the core of those impacts were the idea that we did not deserve the land, that we could not be trusted to manage our own affairs. The stolen generations, the massacres, these were not seen as horrible acts. A lot of the time they were seen as acts of generosity, which is hard for me to even get my head around. But it's important to remember that that truth that we need to speak goes against the grain of how Australia wants to see itself. And the core, when people talk about reconciliation and we're just on the back of Reconciliation Week, I always struggle with that idea, not because I'm in any way opposed to the idea that people should get along, that we have to coexist and that we have to live together. But for me, it's simply because it's not a word that really is in my vocabulary for 51 weeks of the year. It's that one week when people say, what are your thoughts about reconciliation? I don't really think about it until someone asks me about it. And then it's like, oh, why do you oppose reconciliation? It's like, I don't. It's just not what I'm fighting for. What I'm fighting for is the empowerment of Indigenous people, for the advancement of Indigenous people, for the reclaiming of our core truths and our right to speak them. For too often, when we talk about Indigenous rights, our rights as Indigenous people, we're dismissed out of hand. Oh, you want something for free? You want that handout? You want special treatment? And it's like, well, being the Indigenous people of this land is special. Why is it wrong to ask for recognition of that specialness without being made to feel guilty, to feel ashamed for it? And as much as defeating that myth of terra nullius was so celebrated, a lot of us, and I was fairly young when this happened, but I still remember it so profoundly, right off the back of it were more myths 
They're going to come and claim your backyard. They're going to come and take your farm. And that idea has been so intrinsic to holding back Indigenous advancement and Indigenous rights, the idea that for us to have that recognition, for us to have social, cultural, economic opportunities and development has to come at a cost, has to come at a loss to non-Indigenous Australia. But one thing that I know so many people who are a part of that movement of fighting to defeat the myth of Terra Nullius New is that it has not just been a negative impact on us, but it's been a negative impact on non-Indigenous people as well, on the foundation of white Australia. That inability to see us for who we are has come at a cost as well of the humanity of this nation. It has been the thorn in the side of the tales of a fair go, of a meritocracy, of a land, was it, if you have a go, you get a go. <laughs> and that takes its toll on non-Indigenous Australia as well. So when we talk about the power of healing, even though so much of it, and we hear endlessly the negative impacts that have been on Indigenous people through that, there are negative impacts for the rest of the country as well, and this country will never be able to be what it could be until it addresses this. And that core truth, I said so often we're steered away from having those conversations, from having that recognition, from being given the opportunity to inform, to celebrate, and that's something you know, I've dedicated a lot of my life to through my work with Indigenous X is nothing overly profound. I mean, that was a really lovely intro that I get and someone did their research, getting all the list of different things that I've done. Um, basically, that list of really impressive sounding things that I've done is that I was a teacher, I was a primary teacher. And in speaking my truth and in wanting to stand up for the rights of the Indigenous kids in that school to stand up against inappropriate or racist comments that I would encounter, I found myself incapable of being able to remain in teaching. And when you do a teaching degree, you do that to be a teacher. It's not a stepping stone degree that leads to, to a bunch of other things. Maybe to become a principal one day if you're lucky, but I never aspired to that. I wanted to teach kids. That's what I spent four years at uni to do, but only three years in the classroom actually doing. So that impressive list of jobs is actually just me needing to make a dollar and do whatever I could working out what it was that I actually wanted to do and what I would be able to do. And very luckily, I stumbled across not an original idea, but the idea that a platform I had built online I could share with other Indigenous peoples, that there would be strength in diversity and as was mentioned in, in my introduction, I would talk a lot about that misrepresentation in the media and the damage that that misrepresentation carries with it. And so part of that, I would talk a lot about the need for diverse Indigenous voices. Right or wrong, good or bad, educated, flash or not, just we needed to be humanised and we needed to do that on our own terms. And so when people say, oh, how did you get the idea of you know, coming up with Indigenous X? And it's like, the idea of having something that was more than I needed for myself and sharing that with other mob is not an original idea. I can't really take credit for that one. Um, but I'm really glad that I did it. And over the seven years since we started that, we've had hundreds of hosts who've come to tell their own truths, to talk about the different myths that affect Indigenous people. But a lot of people don't talk about that. They might just be a single mum talking about raising kids. They might be a teacher. They might be a lawyer. They might be anyone and everyone. Because when you think about that now, it's more and more common in the last five years particularly to open the newspaper and read an article written from an Indigenous person telling their story. But it wasn't that long ago that if you read an opinion piece in an Australia, it was probably in the Australian and it was probably one of five people. And then through Indigenous X, we've now had hundreds of people and we were able to beat another myth. And that myth is the idea that Australia didn't want to hear from Indigenous people. They might want to hear about Indigenous people, 
but they're not interested in hearing from Indigenous people. The only people who want to hear that are other Indigenous people, and as 3% of the nation, that's not a really big audience, so we're not really going to cater to that. But we've been able to grow a community of people who have said, we want to hear it, we might not agree with it, but it's important that we know it, that we see that truth. And that, more than anything else I will ever achieve in my life, apart from being a husband and father, but my impact, my legacy, is simply that, that we can tell our own stories, that our stories matter. And you can't talk about Indigenous rights, Indigenous empowerment, Indigenous excellence, which is what the X stands for, without acknowledging the backdrop against which that sits. And that is, when the phrase Indigenous excellence was coined, for many people that didn't exist. They were almost oxymoronical. Those words didn't go together. We talk about Indigenous deficits, Indigenous disadvantage, Indigenous imprisonment, Indigenous overrepresentation and incarceration, whatever it may be. But we didn't always talk about those strengths. And we didn't talk about why those strengths hadn't been seen and hadn't been recognised. And a big part of that, from my perspective, navigating these spaces, working in education, in media, and thankfully through starting Indigenous X, I now get to work in health, I get to work in any, any number of areas, is that white Australia has not allowed us to have that excellence and to claim that excellence because to recognise that challenges those myths that grew from terra nullius. So every framing of Indigenous people needs to be one that reinforces the idea that we need charity, that we need reconciliation as a gift to us, that every policy, every act that's being done is done purely with our best interests at heart, but it simply takes that long to civilise the savage. And so every failure of government policy gets pushed through that lens. And every rejection of those myths from Indigenous people gets put into the, well, you just need to get over the past, you just need to move on, you need to take responsibility for yourselves. And I think if any group have taken more responsibility for the history of Australia, it's us. We take the responsibility for reconciliation. We take the responsibility for healing. We take the responsibility for not just looking after our families, but for educating non-Indigenous Australia as well. And that emotional load can be crushing at times. It can be amazingly rewarding at other times, but it can be relentless. But I remember when the documentary First Contact came out and they had a group of white fellows travelling around to different Indigenous communities and there was a, a stat that came out from uh, Reconciliation Australia that said, did you know that six out of ten white Australians have never met an Indigenous person? I thought, and? I haven't met a lot of people here tonight, but I still know that you are human. I know that you have human rights. I know that you deserve respect and fair treatment. We don't need to have met each other for this to happen. And as I wrote quite cheekily at the time, that's a lot of white followers all for us all to meet. That's a, that's a full-time job. You got it like, <laughs> like, that's a lot of work. Um, but that's that, that expectation that we have to prove our worth, that we have to prove we deserve our rights. When we've had opportunities, limited though they may be, like ATSIC. Now, ATSIC was never set up to really achieve what it's now blamed for failing to achieve. It was never really given the capacity to do that. But when it was wound up, John Howard at the time said, this is the failed experiment of self-determination. We've given Indigenous people a go. They've stuffed it up. They can't be trusted. We'll take it back and we'll take it from here. Thank you very much. But it isn't something that we need to prove. Our right to self-determination is inalienable. We have a right to control our own destinies. We have a right to maintain our connections to land and to water. For those people who have lost those or who are losing those, we have a right to rebuild them. 
we have a right to rebuild our languages to maintain the ones that luckily are still thriving. We have a right to our families, to our children. These aren't things that you should need to prove you are capable of. These are things that should be a given. And yet so much of our time, so much of our energy is wound up in what effectively boils down to, hey, did you know if you cut us, we bleed? Did you know that we care for our children? That we love our land? When we had the footy players recently, got up and said, I don't want to sing that anthem, it doesn't represent me. Why do you hate this country so much? <laughs> Look, we love this country. Not the nation state colony bit, but this land, this country, we love it. And to have that pulled into question, you have to start to, in turn, question what kind of myths can we have, can be so common within white Australia that you can actually write an article saying these people need to leave the country if they don't love it. <laughs> and not just that, but a country that's actually doing that. We're having high court battles. We're saying, is it okay to deport Indigenous people if they've got dual citizen ship somewhere else? Like that's, that's a real question that we're actually answering as a nation right now. And a lot of the, the tests that are being put in front of us, we are failing. And a big part of that for me is coming back to those core truths, what we need to keep sight on, what conversations we need to be having. Where is that space for the national narrative? What are those things that are going to move us forward? Just recently we saw, I think this was through the ABC, but there was that big work, you know, when are we going to have an Indigenous PM? That to me is, is the wrong question. It'll happen, we'll have one. And I really pity that fella because they're going to have a really hard time. Um, <laughs> and I say, you know, if you want to be the first Indigenous PM, I'd be like, hold on a minute, maybe be the third or fourth. <laughs> you, you don't want to be that first one. Um, but the reality is, having an Indigenous person at the top of broken systems that fail Indigenous people is not necessarily going to be the ones that fix those broken systems. We need to look at what in those systems is broken and how do we address it. We don't need to look at individual adva advancement as signifiers of Indigenous growth and empowerment collectively because unfortunately, all too often, and I know a lot of us you know, who have succeeded or who hold up those heroes often get met with, well, they did it, so why can't you? If they were able to overcome that, that oppression, that system, that racism, and they were able to succeed, well, then if you didn't do that, that's on you. That's not on the system that failed you. That's on your individual failing. But when you've got that giant tuna net, you're still going to catch a lot of tuna no matter what you do. There might be one or two tuna who get out, but you don't point at the rest and go, well, that's on you, because that net was caught to catch those tuna. And very much our systems were not made for us to succeed within. Our systems, for the most part, were built around the very premise that we don't belong in them. And even though the laws that explicitly said you're not allowed to go to this school, you're not allowed to live in this town, you're not allowed to swim in that swimming pool, a lot of those laws have been removed. But we haven't gone so far as to put in law to ensure that we have to be given equitable treatment within them, that we have to be given respect, that we have to have access to our own ways of being and doing within those systems. Now, all too often I'll work with different organisations who want a, a reconciliation action plan, because that's all the rave at the moment, has been for a little bit now. And under their Indigenous employment bit, they'll go, we've got a space for two Indigenous trainees that we're going to bring in. And we're hoping that they can help us decolonise our institution. <laughs> and I've done that, you know, particularly when I started out with my work, a lot of it was in education. And I was like, well, why don't you go hire an Indigenous principal? We got them. Why don't we get an Indigenous minister? We got them too. Why don't we get, you know, those two 18-year-olds, the pressures that you feel to, one, we want you to decolonise our space and make it you know, better for Aboriginal people, but we don't want you to talk about racism. We don't want you to get too ahead of yourself. We don't want you to speak out of turn. We don't want you to expect a promotion. 
but we do want you to organise a morning tea, and if we could get an elder in to do a welcome, and... <laughs> and they want to be paid, what? That's crazy talk. But that work, these, these processes, like I said, are not going to bring about those outcomes that we know we need to achieve. And so, for me, when I think about those core truths and how they're going to help us achieve those core outcomes, you know, I've, I've got that truth here and I've got that outcome here and that pathway in the middle, it, it can seem a bit elusive, it can seem a bit, a bit smoky. It's like trying to look in the back of the crowd of these very, very bright lights looking down on me. I can't, I can't quite see it all. But the one thing I do know is the moment that we let go of those truths, we're never going to achieve those goals because those truths are those goals. The moment we let go of those truths of who we are and what are our rights as Indigenous peoples, the moment that we accept the idea that closing the gap is the outcome rather than an obvious. And so when people say, why do you oppose close the gap? It's like, I, I want to live. I don't oppose closing the gap. It's just that's not the end goal. That does nothing to recognise the rights of Indigenous people as Indigenous peoples. And where, for me, Indigenous rights and human rights are not separate categories removed is that after 230 years of the colony failing to give Indigenous peoples our human rights, the best way to achieve them, in my mind, is through a process of Indigenous rights, of self-determination, of control of our own systems. Not just self-determination for our peak bodies to set policy and practice, although that is essentially and fundamentally important as well, but the self-determination for our peoples to determine our status as Indigenous peoples within the colony, to determine our relationship within the colony or without the colony. And I don't know what the outcomes of self-determination will be. And for me, that's a, that point again where people say, you've got to prove it, you've got to fight for it. But what are you going to do if you get it? It's like, well, that's for us to decide. And in that journey, in that process, we might make mistakes looking at the rest of our government or looking at any government around the world, it seems that it's fair to say mistakes are probably likely to be made along the way, and that's okay. That's, that's how you learn. Now, whatever mistakes there may or may not have been within ATSIC, which I certainly don't think they are as significant as what they're said to be today, you don't just abolish that and move on. If we did that every time the government made a mistake, we would have never had a government. But keeping those core truths true, passing that on to our children, even if we're laughed at, even if we're ridiculed, even if we're put down as wanting something for free, wanting something special, wanting special treatment, not being ashamed to say, yes, I want special treatment, because it's special to be Indigenous. It's not better or worse. It's not, I'm not talking superior or inferior peoples. I'm talking being Indigenous is special. And it's not a threat to the colony. It's a fact. It's a core truth. It is our truth. And our truth should not be seen. What I dream of is not our truth being our truth, just being truth, of course. We have those rights. Hello, Sophie. And that's all I can hope for, for my own legacy. I don't dream that I will ever achieve a Mabo moment in my lifetime I don't aspire to. But where that legacy, I hope, inspires mine is that my children will grow up and said, he's a man who spoke truth. For better or worse, whatever he did or did not do, he spoke what he believed is true and I hope it inspires in them to pursue their own truths, to not listen to those people who tell them that two plus two equals five.
but to hold on to that knowledge of what they know, of who they are, and of where we need to be. Hopefully they'll do a better job at me and go, I know exactly how we're going to do it, because I still don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know if it's going to be tr treaty, I don't know if it's going to be an Uluru statement, I don't know if it's going to be an Indigenous PM. But I know that if we lose sight of our goals, if we lose sight of our truth, that's when we get swept up in the wrong direction, and that's where we don't know where we need to go. That's where we don't know who we are and what we are. And that, to me, more than any other horrendous, and some of the things are horrendous, but the other things that Indigenous peoples face, nothing to me could ever be worse than the idea of losing our sense of who we are. Because we are Indigenous. This is our land. Our sovereignty was never ceded. Native title is not land rights. Reconciliation is not justice. And these are the conversations we need to have. And I hope to continue these conversations with some of you mob out there later. So, thank you. Thank you, Luke. I think there's a lot to unpack as you were strolling across the stage, and I think the cameramen are now really happy you're in one place. <laughs> Apologies for that. <laughs> um, just a reminder that you can join the conversation if you have a question for Luke using the uh, Marbo Oration hashtag. Uh, you can use it on Twitter or on Facebook, and those will get sent through to me. So um, if you do have a question, please use that hashtag. Uh, Luke, when you talk about Indigenous rights. I wanted to know what do you mean exactly by that, if you can articulate that a little bit more, but also why the separation from Indigenous rights from human rights? Why that distinct separation for you? I think, for me, the, the importance of distinguishing the two, and, and I touched on it a bit, or at least I was thinking it, I don't know what I actually said, but I was definitely thinking it while I was up there, <laughs> was that if we focus on human rights, then that's very likely to get left to the systems that currently exist to deliver those. That's going to be handed to the government, as we so often see with housing, with clean water, with employment. Whereas when you start talking about Indigenous rights, at the core centre of Indigenous rights is the right to self-determination. And that means we need the capacity to achieve those outcomes for ourselves. And so for me, why I prefer to talk about Indigenous rights than human rights is, in the simplest of terms, that I don't necessarily trust our government to deliver them after you know, however many years it's been since we abolished the protectorate, since we abolished the welfare boards. But even during those times, you know, that was for our betterment. And too many of our statistics we've seen slip backwards. And so you, know, you, can, you can debate whether that's through design or through inability or whatever that may be, but we have a right to achieve those for ourselves and I don't think they can be achieved by anyone else. And so the only way to really centre the role of Indigenous people in Indigenous advancement is to talk about Indigenous rights. So do you believe that we need to rethink human rights in this country, that we need to rethink what that means in the context of particularly First Nations Australians? Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, we often talk about the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and look at the ways we're failing those, but if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights, we're failing a lot of those as well. And so I think you know, the, the status of Indigenous peoples, I think in many ways, like I said, for the, the health of this nation, you know, unfortunately, where are those canaries in the coal mine that you know, if Indigenous people aren't doing well, then the country's not doing well, then something is fundamentally wrong with the colony. But I think it's, it's important when we're looking at the country, we acknowledge so many other people who are suffering um, and who are being denied their human rights as well. And so, you know, when, when we look at just from the treatment of unemployed people to people with disabilities, to refugees, to so many of our immigrant communities, um, you know, we see those different but similar myths that are being put on them. Um, you know, we're, we're saving people by stopping boats. We're, 
helping people um, you know, through punitive measures on Centrelink, we're encouraging them to get jobs by cutting off their, their payments or making people live on you know, income that is far below the, the poverty line. Um, so you know, I, I think centering those conversations about Indigenous rights, I would hope if we can make moves in those, we would see advancements in a lot of other areas as well. You spoke a lot about truth tonight, and I want to know how important is truth in 2019 to that narrative that surrounds First Nations Australians? I think it's fundamental. It's, you know, you can, you can really feel like you're just losing your grip on reality when you engage in so much of the mainstream media and the, the conversations that are had about us without us that you know, then we met with in you know, random interactions, be it online or in person. Why do you mob do this? Why do you think that? And it's like, we don't do that. We don't think that. That's not things that we say or do. They're just things that other people have said we say or do for, you know, again, you know, through, through that ignorance or that misunderstanding. But I think a lot of people who believe those myths do so out of ignorance. But I think it's important that we remember that a lot of these myths were not created out of ignorance, they were created quite willingly and, and willfully. You know, at the moment we're seeing a resurgence in a push for Indigenous science, Indigenous astronomy particularly is, is going great guns at the moment. And a lot of those records are early whitefella anthropologist, scientist records. They, they knew that truth, we're not rediscovering it now. That truth was known by very clever people who documented very clearly these people have agriculture, they have science, they have sophisticated ways of knowing and being and of caring for this land. And there were conscious, willful decisions that were made to not include those in the national story. And for me, that always comes back to, if we acknowledge those things, then we have to acknowledge that this country was not terra nullius. And when we look at those models of you know, white saviour mindset of that charitable mindset of like, we're trying to help these people. So much of that goes against the grain of, of when we know the things that people turned a blind eye to, of, of the myths that were created and, and perpetuated, and I've completely forgot what your question was. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, let, I'll, <laughs> I'll let you bring it back. Well, I mean, you <sighs> mentioned Indigenous... Um, these bright lights, they're... <laughs> they're putting you throwing off, me, They're throwing putting me. you off. Um, <laughs> And I, I suppose Indigenous um, as, astronomy is a good example mm. of that uh, in terms of um, people kind of dismissing the mm. knowledge that is there. And I mean, it is something that if you have been on Twitter, it is something that you have seen is uh, Aboriginal women who happen mm. to be also astrophysicists feeling that pushback of people yeah. telling them they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. But yet they've trained in the Western context and... Uh, applying it in a traditional context to what it is that they do. So, I mean, I suppose my question around the truth in 2019 is how do you continue to push back on that when you are seeing that, that sort of thing online and that those conversations are still happening where there's this belief, as you mentioned, that we didn't have the science, that we were hunters and gatherers and we were primitive in some way? Mm. I think... Yeah, when we're talking about those truths and, and the work those particularly young Indigenous women are, are doing at the moment, yeah, and, and gets back to what I was saying about like the six out of ten and, and how many white followers out there would have, like if they were to try and convince every person that comes at them with that, you didn't have science, you didn't have this, you didn't have that, that would be a, a thousand lifetimes worth of work trying to educate each and every one of those people or they could just get on with the work that they're doing, which is amazing and exciting, and let that work stand for itself. And so while we, we do need people who are trying to educate non-Indigenous people and who are challenging those myths and stereotypes, we can't get too bogged down in them that we forget to actually just get about doing the work. I think when it comes to Twitter, a lot of people think it's a cesspit of negativity. <laughs> Just They're not put wrong. That out there. <laughs> Don't know if people agree or not. Um, but I wanted to kind of ask about, you know, how have you used Twitter in that way um, in terms of Indigenous rights, in terms of truth telling, but also in terms of you mentioning, you know, the telling of our stories? Mm. 
I think, you know, for me, and I've, I've been on Twitter a long time, probably too long, um, but probably a decade or so now, and in, in the early day, there was no thinking about that. We were just saying things that were common sense and that were true, and then a lot of people, you know, Indigenous or non-Indigenous people would, would join in those conversations, and particularly non-Indigenous people just go, well, I've never thought of that before, I've never heard that, or that goes against what I was taught when I was in school or what I see in the media, and, and realising there was an appetite for people who wanted to hear that. And like I said, you know, that's where I always sort of get a bit shame when people are like, oh, you've done these amazing things, and it's like, I, I just tweet stuff, I just say <laughs> what I think is, is obvious. And, you know, so many of the people, whether like their teachers who are talking about it and go like, I've never heard anyone say that before. And it's like, I used to have been going out the back of the shed after the ACG meeting in the afternoon. Because that's what Bob was just saying very, very plainly. For some reason, you know, like I was saying, that rejection of our truth, we've been taught not to say a lot of these things in front of white people for, you know, professional consequences, for personal consequences, for social consequences. So, so much of that stuff is just kept off the radar of social interactions. And so much of that was kept off the, radio, off the radar in media spaces who, you know, we, we only know what's happening in places that we aren't because of what we hear through those, you know, luckily we've got the, the grapevines that swing around the nation so we always know what other mob we're up to, but non-Indigenous Australia had no idea of these very obvious things like people who wouldn't want to sing the anthem. And it's like that, like, I, I don't even know how to, how to begin to explain why people wouldn't want to sing the anthem and in 2019 to have people going like I didn't know this was a thing and it's like and Titus had that song anthem in like the 90s and it's a great song you should really just go and listen to that and it still wasn't new then either it's like yeah, opposition to invasion day to Australia day and I, I, I did an interview you know, speaking of Twitter and there was a fellow who was like oh yeah in the last few years there's been a lot of resistance to Australia day from indigenous people and it's like 1938 day of mourning? Like, is that, <laughs> this is not new. This is not, yeah, and, um, it was 1888, Henry Parks, who was the Premier of New South Wales at the time. Someone, amazingly, I'd love to know the story of this journey, but they said, like, what are you going to do for Aboriginal people? In, like, what, what's their role going to be in the centenary of, of Australia at Australia Day? It's like, what, why would we do that? We'd just be reminding them that we robbed them. Um, yeah, so, like, it was, it used to be common sense knowledge in Australia that, Australia was not made for us, for our benefit, that Australia Day was not something we would want to celebrate. And then in the rewriting of the Australian narrative, somehow it, it's seen again as a deficiency in us that we should, you know, when we say, you know, I'm Aboriginal and someone's non-Aboriginal, you're being divisive. Why are you trying to make it us and them? And it's like, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. Like I'm me and you're you and the two of us are us and they're them. And you know, they, these aren't confrontational truths. These are just common sense truths. But they're so often framed as, you know, that, that we have this maliciousness, that we have this hatred, that we have, and, you know, for me, I'm quite often, like, you're a very controversial figure, and it's like, I don't, I'm, I'm a pretty happy fella. Well, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think what I'm saying is that controversial, or it certainly shouldn't be. And so that, that truth, you know, what I hope that a lot of us are doing through Indigenous X, through Indigenous Twitter, through other, you know, Indigenous media projects is, we're just making it obvious. We're just making it transparent. We're just bringing to the light those things that, you know, for a lot of mobs, like even if you disagree with what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> like, and, and it's about that. You don't have to agree with what I'm saying at all. You just shouldn't be so confused and confronted by Indigenous people speaking core truths. And there's definitely no grey areas when it comes to you. Pretty I like to think I'm pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> Indigenous X has been a lot about changing the narrative and changing the narrative around First Nations Australian. Mm. How is that push going in changing those perspectives, in changing those conversations, in trying to have those conversations in a more open forum? Uh, that's a big thanks to mainstream media there for giving me no shortage of opportunities to talk about things that are wrong with the narrative. Um, <laughs> yeah, like... It's again when people say, you know, like, what's, what's the best way to get someone who's racist to not be racist? Or what's the best way to get... There, there are so many different ways. And I mean, if we knew how to cure racism, it wouldn't be a problem anymore. We would have fixed that one by now. Um, but, you know, changing that narrative is not always about trying to address that ignorance. 
a lot of the time it's just about having conversations amongst ourselves, but inviting non-Indigenous people to come and listen to them. It's, it's holding up a mirror. And, you know, more recently I've started to write a few more sort of overtly sarcastic uh, parody type articles where, you know, recently there was one in the Australian before that Kerry Ann Kennelly, you know, went on that big rant and God knows what that was about. But, you know, like, you mob in Sydney, you all need to go to the Northern Territory and everything else. And the Australian ran an article that said, Indigenous leaders support Kerry Ann Kennelly. And it was um, Warren and Ken and Jacinta Price. And I was like, they're three people. They're all Liberal Party members, I might add. But beyond, you know, whatever you might think of, of those people as, as individuals, and I, I'm not even necessarily being critical of them, it's the fact that that phrase, Indigenous leaders, carries with it this idea that we all think the same, that we have a central leadership who can speak on our behalves. And that painting of Indigenous people through that pan-Indigenous lens of, you know, like I said, when one Indigenous person says something, a dozen other Indigenous people have someone say, why do you mob think that? It's like, take it up. They said that. I didn't say that. And so I, I ran an article that were like, white leaders oppose Kerry Ann Kennelly, and I <laughs> interviewed a few white people um, and got them... What did you find out? They really oppose Carrie Ann, so you know, I can safely say, <laughs> ad admittedly, I handpicked them and I wrote their quotes for them, and then I asked them if it was okay <laughs> that I get them to say that, and they were, they were very generously on board. Because um, there gets a time when, you know, like I said, you, you can dedicate your entire life, and, and people do, to researching the fact that we, ha that we are amazing, that we had amazing things, and it's while you know, people commit themselves to those journeys because they're fascinated by that knowledge and that they want to unpack it, I said in entire lifetimes, rather than you know, looking at, at something new and taking ideas forward, are having to be spent unpacking those myths and those lies and those untruths and, and trying to heal the damage that they've been done. You know, scientists going through Western science spaces to prove that Indigenous science is real and achieving amazing things, but still every day, not just from random internet trolls, but from people within their own institutions. You know, we're seeing it with teachers, with academics, with scientists, with so many people who are like, no, we, we're real and we had real stuff and that stuff is awesome. And actually that really awesome stuff you think you have is kind of destroying our rivers and our land and our farming land. And so we might actually want to look at that if we want to have any hope of achieving sustainability in this country. And the fact that there's so much pushback against that really, you know, like I said, you, you can get angry at it and you can get frustrated, and I do, I get cranky about it all the time, but for me, I'm, I'm finding a lot of joy in uh, being sarcastic and writing the parody articles and having a bit of fun with it. And I'm finding that's actually having a, a lot of traction with a lot of people, just realising, because you know, when I wrote that, that article about white leaders opposing Kerry Ann, a lot of the questions I was getting about that one were like, also, you don't like Warren and just and it's like, no, it's not about them. It's about the fact that we don't have Indigenous leaders. Just say Indigenous people support Kerry Ann if you want, or Indigenous Liberal Party members, or, you know, and for some, for some communities, we might have our leaders, but we don't have an Indigenous leader. It's not a thing that exists. And the, I got tired of trying to explain that. And I, I thought the best way to do that was to talk about white leaders. And have people go, well, that's not a thing. That's not real. That doesn't exist. And it's like, see, now you know. That's, that's what we do. And so, you know, that, that changing the narrative is really, like I said, there's so much unpacking that needs to be done. But beyond that, you know, correcting the myths are just telling those stories that never get told. You know, like when we have someone who just gets on and talks about something completely random, I love that. Because as Indigenous people, we don't all just want to talk about Indigenous stuff all day. You know, like, I do a lot when I'm on stage, that's kind of, but that's what I've chosen to do. And a lot of the time when we get invited, you know, no one's asking me what I think about those other things. So you go into these spaces and you talk about these things because I, I love talking about them. I've studied them, I've researched them, I've worked with mob of, you know, like this is who I am and what I am and what I choose to do. But then when that's all people see, Someone else will look at another Aboriginal person and go, oh, well, they're not trying to educate me. They're one of the bad Aborigines. He's one of the good Aborigines. And then I've got to spend time unpacking that. And so it's, you know, the, the myths that have grown around that seed of terra nullius, I look at it as this infinite ball of knots that you're just constantly trying to undo. And if you've ever tried to undo a big ball of knots, it is really horrifically infuriating. You've got to find ways of finding joy within that process of 
you know, keeping yourself interested and refreshed because for me, like I said, you know, just like we've got to keep onto that, those core truths, we've also got to keep onto our own quality of life. You know, I think before I was a, a parent um, and a husband, um, you know, I, was, I was kind of happy just to, you know, just to keep going until I burn out. You know, I, I, I work nonstop all day, every day. And I was just like, well, this is the hill I'm going to die on. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And you know, my personal life might sacrifice for it, but I, I'm doing it for what I hope is for a greater good. And realising that me having that, that sense of self and that happiness and that connection and spending time on my own cultural journeys, that's worth fighting for too. You know, to sacrifice yourself for the greater good is not the goal because then as, as a role model, the legacy I'm leaving for other people coming after me is like, that's what you should do. That's a good way to spend your life. And so now I try to find that balance of, I do want to change that narrative, I do want to tell those stories, but I don't want to send a message that, you know, to do that you've got to stay in that manic, angry, frustrated space. You can do it in innovative ways, you can do it in fun ways, you can do it in ways that, that bring other people along with you, you know, not as followers, but as leaders in their own right, on their own journey. But when you have an article like that, it must... I mean, how do you feel when it, when, when it does cut through, when it does seem to be starting to change that narrative, when you see people coming on board and supporting what Indigenous X does? I think, you know, for me, as someone who writes pretty prolifically at times and some of my articles do quite well and some of them really do not, um, as, as is the nature of, of the art, um, you know, I've, I've learnt to just be happy with that. Like, oh, I was tickled with that one, I love that article. And, and I thought it'd do well, but if it hadn't, I would have still been happy with it because I had fun writing it. It, it. it was a joy for me. And then when you get the added bonus of it having a positive impact, then you're like, okay, there's, there's something there that I, I can work with in that space with the audience. But you know, again, I, I don't take it as, as my personal responsibility to try and educate the world or entertain the world or, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to be true to myself and to have a good life while I'm doing it. I'm aware of time, so I might just check what we've got Twitter-wise. And we did get a Twitter question earlier while you were on stage, Jeez. which was um, from Dr Sandy O'Sullivan, who asked, <laughs> why has humour been so important to Indigenous X? I think it's one of those things that's just so important to Indigenous people and I think there's something innately comedic about things that are ludicrous, even when those things are horrible. And so, you know, like, the idea that it was a peaceful settlement is innately comical because we know how untrue that is. Um, even though the realities that underpin that are, are brutal and, and horrific, the only... Yeah, the natural response to being confronted by something that is just so bafflingly untrue is, is to have a laugh at it and to shake your head and go, oh, my God. But, you know, that's what we do when we come together. We, we find ways to comfort each other, to, to find joy in life. And, and I just don't... And, again, I, I don't think that's anything yeah, in, innately special about Indigenous people. I think that's an essential survival mechanism for all people who are confronted with realities that conflict with what they know to be true. Um, and, you know, I said for me, I, just, I like a laugh. I like taking... <laughs> I like... Um, I, I couldn't imagine doing it and, and not having fun with, with the way that we do it, with not laughing. And I, I couldn't imagine my life without laughter. Even those times when I said, you know, when I was burning the candles at, at both ends and I was really... Um, you know, not looking after myself and my well-being, I would still find ways to find joy in, in life and in, in what I was doing and in ways that I would, would share those stories and those truths. And I think, you know, just as jokes so often, I think for us we know probably better than most people in Australia how much they can be weaponised against you, they can also be amazing tools of empowerment as well. And, you know, laughing at the ignorance of some of those jokes, you know, like I always, and, and everyone would have heard this at some point growing up, it's like, what do you call a stick, that, a, a boomerang that doesn't come back? I gave away the punchline. <laughs> what do you, what do you, what do you call, what a, do you call a, a boomerang, boomerang that, that doesn't come and they go, back, Luke? Yeah, a stick. And it's like, no, it's a killer boomerang. A lot of boomerangs don't come back. That's, that's a number seven. That's, 
Like, that's, you don't even know. Like, you've been here 200 years and you don't even know boomerangs. Like, it's the one thing you've held up as a symbol. Like, that joke's not funny. It's just not true. Like, but the truth is funny when you tell it that way. And so, you know, you can educate through humour. And, and for me, that's, like I said, just seeing it, it, so much of what I see and of what I talk about is just so ludicrous. I don't know what else to do but to make a joke of it. Uh, this one comes, I think... Also, oh, hi, Sandy, wherever you are. Yeah. I think this comes from someone in the Northern Territory. What do you think an open and honest voice can achieve for a place like Wad Air? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, so much of what goes on in, in so many of our remote communities, you know, when we talk about the lenses that Indigenous people are perceived through, I think remote communities cop absolute hell in, in that space and always have. Um, and, you know, their, their truths matter as much as, as anyone else's. And the need for change and the need for self-determination, I don't think is, you know, it is just so poignant and powerful there. So the ability to have those conversations, to say, you know, like we're talking about, like we're not a charity case. We're not here looking for white saviours. We're actually looking for opportunities to develop our own communities. And I was lucky enough to spend a bit of time up in Bodan. We're lucky enough to have, have some mob from there here tonight. Um, and it, it's very humbling to have them here as, as a part of this um, and, and for Indigenous X to be working with them. But, you know, when you go there, like I said, you see the, the things that you don't see on TV that you don't read <coughs> in the media, and that's just people getting on with their lives, doing the best that they can. You know, and, and people getting there, oh, they don't need a hand out, they need a hand up and they need this, and, and whatever language, you know, it's just like, and these, these are just people. And they need the opportunity to tell their own stories in their own words. And so I'm very mindful in giving an answer that I'm not speaking for what air. That's, yeah, there's mob here that people here should talk to and, and go talk to them about what they want in their communities. But for me, again, it comes back to that core principle, that self-determination, that they have that right. Philippe on Twitter asks, if reconciliation is not genuine justice, what do you recommend that non-Indigenous white Australians do who are currently engaged in efforts to integrate Aboriginal history and cultural oh awareness God. into their communities? <laughs> <laughs> I should probably preface this with there are a couple of these. So. <laughs> oh, God, I think I need to hear that one again. Um, what, what do I recommend white followers do? Is, is what, I, what I heard. Um, <laughs> um, work it out. Oh, no, leave me alone. I got other things. Um, but I think, you know, when... Because there's so much, and I think this is a big part of the problem with the pan-Indigenous, Indigenous leaders conversation. You know, there's so many well-meaning people who very sincerely say when it's like, well, what, what, you know, what, what do you want to see happen? They go, I, I, I want to support whatever Indigenous people want. And it's like, well, I want one thing and you want another thing and whatever mob might want another thing. And within whatever, there's probably 20 mob who want 20 different things. You, you can't just fall back and use us as, as that excuse not to do your own research and come up with your own decisions. You know, what, what is happening in Indigenous spaces and what non-Indigenous people, you know, individuals or organisations or systems or, or whatever are doing, of course, needs to be informed by Indigenous voices. It needs to be informed by best practice. It needs to be informed by evidence and common sense. But people have to take ownership of their own opinions within this space. Now, you can agree with me, you can agree with someone else, but you can't say, I defer you know, my need to take ownership of my beliefs and my actions, because I'm just doing whatever Indigenous people want. Because you'll do 50 different things with every Indigenous person you meet. Sorry, I, just I have no idea back. if I answered his question. I feel bad for that fella. Sorry if I didn't. Tweet me, tweet me later, Philippe, and <laughs> we'll have a yard. <laughs> Dare Power One asks, is reconciliation still a worthy goal? Are the raps of our corporate entities still valuable if they come from a genuine desire to make a difference? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, you can. <laughs> yeah, I, I look at, at raps and a, a lot of those things of like, you know, you, you could just do the right thing, like you don't really need, <laughs> like, yeah, like just don't be racist, like hire, like, hire Aboriginal people, you know, like, um, but, you know, if, if a rap helps you do that, then man, have a rap, like, that's cool, I'm, I'm fine with that, 
but you know, you, like Indigenous X doesn't have a rap, and I don't see us getting one <laughs> anytime soon. Like we we're just getting on with it. Um, so, but I, I think you know, a big part of of that problem is, is these these symbolic gestures that we don't interrogate. And so you know, they can say, "Go like we've got a rap, so therefore we're doing something good," as opposed to like, "Well, what's in your rap?" Like you've you've named one of the, the rooms in your building after a local language word or after a, a famous Aboriginal person, you have a, a reconciliation morning tea, you fly a flag up the front. Um, like, and they're cool things, like you should definitely do those things, but those things aren't things if Indigenous people still can't succeed within your institutions as staff, as clients, as, as whatever it is that you're doing. And you can just get on, that's why even, even the idea of a treaty, it's like, if Australia had just done the right thing or just did the right thing, then we wouldn't need a treaty because we'd just have those things. But because we don't have those things, if a treaty helps us get them, then I'm all for that. If raps yeah, help, help reduce racism, then I'm, I'm all on board. Um, I think we've got time for one more. Um, Leonie has asked, as an educator, what role do you think our current education systems can play in telling our truth? They played a big role in covering up our truths. Do you think they can have a positive impact? I think they have to. I, th I think, and again, you know, I, I did some work um, last year with Akara on the, the teacher notes around Indigenous science and how to embed that you know, throughout the curriculum. And, a big conversation that you know, we had in, internally around that process in the development of their rap plan, funnily enough, um, was that you know, th this is not an act of, of charity for them of doing something good, but it's a core responsibility that they hold. You know, when we're talking about education and science and Indigenous science in education, like science is what proved that we were less than that we were primitive. Education is the space that then taught the non-Indigenous people about that while keeping Indigenous people out of education. And then even when we were let in. Now that's, unfortunately, that's the double-edged sword of um, compulsory Aboriginal perspectives in schools, is if you have someone who is at their core holding on to racist beliefs and you make them teach about Aboriginal people and culture, they're going to teach racist things. And so, how we address that at that core level. It's not a, a curriculum document, it's not a work plan, it's not a lesson plan, and it, it's not you know, that positive education against ignorance of an act of charity. Or, it's, it's a professional responsibility that if they cannot teach our truths, then they are failing Indigenous students. You know, too often we talk about Indigenous students failing at school. That's not possible. We make them go there. That school can fail those Indigenous students, but Indigenous students cannot fail at school. That's that oxymoron, and that's how we need to be changing those, those narratives. Um, so, you know, the role of teachers is absolutely fundamental. Um, but unfortunately for them, a lot of those teachers, they went to school with those other racist teachers who taught them that racist stuff. And then they went to unis where it was not taught well, and now they work in education systems that might have an Aboriginal education policy or an anti-racism policy but they aren't enforced. And those, those frameworks only, only matter as much as people are held to account for them. And so until we can actually address the issue of racism in our schools, I, I fear that is going to continue unabated. Well, on that note, can you please put <laughs> your hands note. together <laughs> for Luke Pearson. <laughs> Well, listening to Luke and Rihanna was like listening to two old friends catch up on the sofa. There were three things I took out of uh, Luke's presentation. The first is uh, tomorrow morning to go and look at the commission's wrap and make sure it doesn't have a morning tea in it. <laughs> Secondly, um, and importantly, and this takes me back to my early days as a native title lawyer, rights uh, are not a gift bestowed by governments, they are inalienable. And uh, finally, the message, a very good, clear message of not losing sight of uh, fundamental truths. So, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the staff of QPAC, who for many years now have worked so seamlessly 
with the Commission to make this oration the success that it is. Special mention goes to John Kotzes, Alex Rosinski, Nadine MacDonald Dowd, Peter Bretherton, Cindy Ulrich, and for my commission, Jody Luck and Michaela Jeffries. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. Please travel home safely. And to finish off this fabulous evening, please welcome the Ancient Bloods. Good night. Thank you and good evening. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the, of the land at which we gathered here today. And um, thank you to all the other speakers and performers before us. Oh, so my name is Nadia, <laughs> we're the Ancient Bloods. Um, I am Bachelor from Fraser Island and Garoa from Gulf of Carpentaria. I'm Michaela, I'm a Darug woman and that's down um, Blue Mountains, Sydney area. And I'm Cormac and I'm Cubby Cubby and that's like Sunshine Coast area. Um, the first song we're going to sing tonight um, is called This Land. It's sort of like an, an acknowledgement song, um, but it's also just really fitting for this occasion and yeah. I am a woman with ancient blood Blazing like the skies above Red dirt, black sky, golden veins Heavy weight in my family name Many years stand by me as I to breathe, to breathe, it comes so naturally when I'm connected to our history, history, and I feel it in this moment, I feel the earth moving, I feel it in this moment. Shows my soul, my whole world in this land, in this land. It shows my soul, my whole world in this land, in this land. I am a woman of ancient blood. This is my land, you stand, you know.
Thank you very much. Um, so, this, <laughs> um, so this next song that we're performing is called Warrior Sphere and uh, it was written um, after hearing stories of how our ancestors' spears were actually dug up and from their burial sites and placed into museums around Australia. And it basically just explores what happens to our ancestors' spirits when their, um, our cultural heritage is locked up. Um, and we performed this song tonight in honour of all those who came before us, especially um, in the namesake of tonight's oration. So thank you so much for having us. This last song, um, we, this is the most fun song. Hopefully you have fun listening to this. But I think it really encompasses our um, political standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Incomplete of ceremonies. Broken traditions leads to lost families. Untold of Australia's dark history. An ignorant society of our spirituality. Tools and weapons taken from its true country just to be used that thing you call money.
We want it back, back to that beautiful land. So there's nothing for that boogeyman, nothing for him, nothing for him. We want it back, back to that beautiful land. So there's nothing for that boogeyman, nothing for him, nothing for him. Politicians saying sorry. But we grieve every time that you celebrate your white history. They're still holding a part of me. I wish we could go back to perfect harmony. Thank you very much. We've been the ancient books. <laughs>